All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our winter community meeting. My name is Chris Nashen, aka Nash. I am the Director of Community for AIGA Connecticut. Um, I'd also like to introduce Kelly Choller, uh, who will be helping moderate tonight's event. Uh, we will also uh, be joined by um, Nancy Rousseau later on tonight, who is our Director for Design for Good, and also Randy Herbertson, who is our Southwest Outreach Chair. Uh, for some really wonderful material from them. Uh, hopefully everyone is hungered down and ready for this storm. Uh, we are also glad you're joining us and taking the time to tune into tonight's event. Um, a friendly reminder that we recommend everyone turn on your cameras uh, so we can all better connect uh, with each other and uh, get to share this experience uh, face to face. Um, we also would like to have you remain muted uh, during our presentations or when others are exchanging in uh, dialogue. That way there are no interruptions um, or miscommunication due to background noises. Uh, feel free to comment or ask questions in the Zoom chat. Our co-moderator Kelly will be sure to uh, keep track of those and when we hit our Q&A sessions uh, we will address any of the questions that pop up um, during uh, the presentation. So definitely weigh in there and um, feel free to also introduce yourselves. Uh, let us know where you're uh, virtually uh, joining us from. Um, also, let us know, um, you know, a little bit more about you. And, um, you know, this is a, a networking opportunity for all of us to um, get together and, and network. So definitely uh, introduce yourselves there and say hi. Uh, we will open up for a Q&A. Uh, towards the end of the, our meeting as well. Um, so feel, feel, feel free to unmute and ask any questions you may have at that point as well. Uh, we recommend you using the Zoom's hand raise button um, as we kind of go through those questions. Uh, you can find this in the participants tab uh, and that way we can uh, direct you when there's an opening during the conversation. And after this event, all attendees will receive an email uh, with a session's recording, um, the Zoom messenger transcript along with any additional resources from the event. And now we'd like to kind of kick off with a nice icebreaker. We're gonna do a live polling session, um, make this a little fun and interactive. So uh, Kelly, if you wouldn't mind, uh, let's, let's launch this thing. You should be getting a pop-up mm -hmm. um, and go ahead and answer these very uh, difficult questions. Uh, and let's see, let's see the results. So question number one, Die Hard is a Christmas movie. True or false? Let us know your favorite hot bevs. Tonight's a perfect night to ask this question. We will be having a break at some point. So if any of you are craving any hot bevs, definitely at that point in time, you can feel free to, to grab one. Gosh, I didn't get the pop-up. Um, maybe see if it tucked behind a, another, uh, window, maybe, um, unless, I don't know if you might have an older version of zoom. It's under polling. So, uh, yeah, I found it. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. There you go. All right. So we're about 80% voted. That's so funny about the lobster question. <laughs> I didn't realize it was a, I feel like you're telling us the answer by asking the question. <laughs> hey, so it's, it's open-ended. It's uh, purely, uh, purely opinion, opinion based. Yeah, the diehard one's going to get heated. <laughs> I got to say out of everything, that one's uh, pretty, pretty close. Listen, I, I uh -oh. so someone <laughs> answered that question and I feel like they, they answered it scientifically and they did hey. a great job. Hey, you know what? Die Hard is a Christmas movie. So is Iron Man 3. Listen, pop culture made it a Christmas movie, whether it was the intent or not. <laughs> All right. About Can I another, share the results? Yeah, another 10 seconds. We got two more. Okay, there oh. we go. No, so I think... <laughs> Okay, <laughs> I'm sharing. Let me see what everyone said. Die Hard is a Christmas movie. It's true. 69% said true. <laughs> All right, uh, verdict is in. Die Hard is a Christmas movie. 
uh, hot chocolate definitely takes the uh, takes takes the top spot for her favorite hot bev. Tea in second place. Two people did say eggnog. Just want to call that. I, I might have selected almost all of them except for her <laughs> Irish coffee. <laughs> I like hot beverages, apparently. Yeah. I mean, so all right, and how do we feel about snow? Majority of us feel that the more, the merrier. So that's, that was actually, I did not expect that, but that's great. And do people actually roast chestnuts over an open fire? Definitely, I never have. Jordan, you said you knew someone who did? Yeah, um, I think it was like two years ago, my mom did. And, you know, she went in with great intentions. Let's just say that. And yeah, we uh, we tried them and it was, I think we all spit them out and threw them right in the garbage. It's a good idea. She always wanted to do it, but terrible execution. So there's one, so someone said that they do. I want to know who who does and how does how does it, how are they? They're roasty. <laughs> all right, and then preferred holiday lights colorful and bright white are down the middle 50 50 wow yeah i'm glad no one chose blue until it hurts because those lights always actually hurt <laughs> laser yeah so our um i don't know if anybody's seen these but um our neighbors have like a laser like oh device. they like, project on the house yeah yeah it's actually uh it's pretty mesmerizing I'm not gonna lie Okay, and six is definitely a very subjective uh, question. Is lobster an appropriate font for the holidays? Um, <laughs> definitely, definitely false. Uh, that is, uh, <laughs> no, it's, okay. it's almost uh, down the middle as well. Uh, this, this is not related to Christmas, but it's relevant to this. But, um, when I went to go pick up a marriage license recently, everything was done Comic Sans. And I didn't think that was appropriate. <laughs> so. In the marriage license? Well, all of the, the the signage in uh, the town hall oh. was in Comic Sans. Not, not the license itself. That'd be ridiculous. Yeah, that's, I was like, no way. <laughs> Isn't what? it considered the most accessible font, though? Comic uh, Sans? Apparently, it's accessible because it helps with like people with reading disabilities. But at the same yeah. time, go into town hall and be like, death certificates this way in Comic Sans. <laughs> in America. Like, it, it's just, it doesn't feel like it goes appropriately with the that mood and the intention awesome all right well good stuff this was uh this was fun if anybody else wants to weigh in on any of these questions in the chat feel free to go ahead and uh expand on on that further um but with that said let's um let's continue on with the meeting um kelly if we can stop sharing the results for now i did awesome okay Okay, um, so who we are, AIJ Connecticut uh, supports our design community through education, advocacy, and inclusion. Uh, we work to engage AIJ members, non-members, and anyone who has an interest in design. Um, all are welcome to join us through our events, uh, volunteer positions, and social engagement. So um, yeah, this is just our mission statement. We like to just kind of have a friendly reminder of that, um, each of our meetings, um, or each of our community meetings. So. Again, um, just really um, mission driven to connect each other uh, in, in, the, in the creative community. Uh, upcoming events, uh, we are excited to have uh, some announcements and uh, for our, one of our upcoming events is um, our Emerging Professionals Workshop. Uh, this is the ultimate how-to on being a design professional, uh, no longer just a day for portfolio reviews. Uh, the new and improved Emerging Professionals Workshop features virtual workshops, as well as creative sessions for students and creative professionals looking to build their skills and learn about the expectations of working in the design industry. Uh, we'll be covering topics such as design career paths, building an online presence, a focus on freelance, and more. Uh, participants are welcome to sign up for a one-on-one -on -one portfolio review with an experienced creative professional. Uh, reviews are optional and spots are limited. Uh, they will be handed, uh, handled on a first come, first serve basis. So if this event is of high interest, please head over to our site and register as soon as you can. 
this event is hot off the press. Uh, join us in a live tutorial of Adobe Animate. Learn how to animate digital banners from our guest presenter and Adobe Pro, Joseph Lebrec, on March 10th. This is a follow along workshop where we will send out assets to attendees so they can try it at home. Joe will talk about animate basics and will walk us through how to animate a banner ad. While we will be opening registration on, in mid-January, um, keep your eyes peeled uh, after the new year when this event opens up. We are also kicking off and taking applications for our 2021 mentorship program. Um, age is just a number when it comes to sharing and receiving information. Uh, sign up if you're ready to share your experience or are in need of guidance. Um, we are in the midst of one of the biggest transformations in history, and as we all get through this year together, we will undoubtedly evolve into better versions of ourselves. And whether we need a mentor or in a position to be a mentee, uh, being a part of this program will only deepen your connection to your fellow creatives here in Connecticut. And we are also excited to announce our design thinking workshop. Um, this is going to be on February 27th. Um, so when this goes live, uh, keep an eye out for this um, as well. And um, we're really excited about uh, uh, this event uh, coming up. And then just a friendly reminder that we do have a Slack uh, workspace. Uh, here is a link uh, to uh, where you can join us on Slack. Um, for those of us joining for the first time or those returning, um, uh, this is just a friendly reminder. Uh, this is the place for to connect and to get involved with the design community here in Connecticut um, and also our neighboring states for those who are working remotely. Um, it's also a great place to stay up to date uh, with AIJ Connecticut events and the people you've met there. All of AIJ Connecticut board members are here and you can reach us directly or subscribe to any of these channels that are relevant to what you're looking for. So head over there to our Slack channel um, using this link. And if you haven't already, we look forward to hearing from you. Okay, so um, let's take some time uh, to catch up and just want to talk with everybody here. What are you guys up to? Uh, what are you working on? Any fun projects? Um, you guys need anything? And uh, this is a time for us to kind of just get together and, and chit chat. So I'm actually gonna uh, stop presenting for the time being so we can uh, see all of our lovely faces. <laughs> I also wanted to say, um, you know, he just went through those what? programs really yeah. quickly. Um, but so if anybody has any questions, we could also chat about that too. Some of those oh, yeah. that are coming up. <clears throat> Anybody feeling courageous? <laughs> I am working on the Center for Pandemic Preparedness for the University of Oxford. Wow, that's wow. cool. So that's been fun cool. so far. Amazing. Yeah, well, I do a lot of work for ah. that. Yeah. What are you creating? I generally create the, the materials to market their program, their um, new buildings that they need to build and um, the program. So I'm designing everything to get people to donate money. Cool. Hey, Julia. <laughs> Anybody else want to share? <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm new to this. <laughs> I'm Melissa Nozzle. I'm a graphic designer. Um, I'm based currently out of Glastonbury. Um, I joined the Connecticut chapter like fresh out of college, so a couple years ago, um, but I kind of ducked out of that um, just at the time things are kind of up in the air, but now I'm trying to get back into it, especially since I'm trying to just advance my career a bit, explore some more options in the industry. Um, upskilling a lot during all of this remote work stuff. So a lot of online courses um, and just trying to improve my skill sets and, and network more. So that's why I'm here. <laughs> that's awesome. awesome. Thank you. Choices, Melissa. What courses are you looking at? I'm just curious. Cause I'm like, I'm a huge fan of just like keeping every tab open of something I want to eventually watch, but never do. Yeah. So, I mean, through my partner, um, like I use his portal site sometimes nice. to explore like UX design, um, but more so I'm, I'm focused on like graphic design and illustrations and like iconography and, and that kind of thing. 
Um, but right now I work for an insurance broker, so it's not necessarily where my heart lies. Um, I did come from a nonprofit sector and I do freelance um, actually for my former employers. Um, so I kind of like that kind of civic engagement and social justice work where I get to be creative and have a really good impact. And so when I saw the, the topic for today of like design for good, I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so that's kind of why I'm here. Awesome. Um, but a lot of courses, like I even did one where it was like just touching base again about like a three hour course on color theory. And I was like, it's been a while since I, you know, broke out the color aid and thought about <laughs> color theory. So yeah. Same. A good resource that anybody looks at, Pantone actually offers a number of courses for free. <clears throat> if you're interested in color theory and color, and you can actually go into them for free. They offer, if you go to their website, they have a lot of courses available. Nice. What do you guys think yeah. about their new colors? I was going to ask. 2021, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> a product using both of them. <laughs> um, uh, let me find the, there was an awesome post I saw on Instagram that like, did a good job of making like an alternative color utilizing like a mask. I thought that was awesome. Let me try. Oh, yeah. it. I liked the, um, I, it went viral on like social media. Uh, there was that post of California and the skies of California as like an orange and they <laughs> took um, a Pantone swatch and made that the color of the year or two, which is interesting. It's sad. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Yeah, people are getting real with it. <laughs> I know, and that's interesting too, because I feel like the Pantone colors of the year um, supposedly came from a place of like wanting to bring joy and happiness because like yellow is associated with joy and happiness. And I'm not mm -hmm. sure, I forget the meaning behind like the choosing the neutral gray, but then memes like that, it's kind of like funny, but it, then it's also like real, like, oh, um, if you were to pick Pantone color of the year based on a mask or the colors of the California sky, that is such like a more realistic um, sort of, I don't know, a little bit of like a downer view, but I don't know what I'm trying to say. I guess just. Yeah. It does feel more representative maybe <laughs> of the year as a whole. <laughs> How do they even pick the color of the year? What is the criteria for this? Why they, they do a whole year worth yeah. of, uh, <laughs> color exploration. They have a, a global panel of color um, consultants and experts and trend panels and things like that. Mm. So it, it, what they're also looking for ultimately is, is, is commercial colors that people will use across a lot of things, but they're looking at a lot of different things. And so they have a, a panel of 20 sort of leadership companies that they work with that uh, are sort of uh, trend experts, but then they also look broader than that. But their ultimate goal, these colors, is not just doing it for bounty's sake. They want to actually see them out commercially. And it had its origins at a um, printing company, actually. Exactly right. I work with a lot of financial companies. So last year, when the color was classic blue, I felt like they only interviewed financial companies because that's <laughs> all they use, that color blue. <laughs> so there was a strong rumor there was going to be a different color. AI, it was called AI Aqua. And that was what everybody thought that for sure was going to be. It was leaked early. And then they did a total pivot and did the two colors, so. I'm not really thrilled with the gray myself. I would have just gone with the inspirational colors. Yeah, they're always doing something different. I uh, really liked the coral. That was a cool one. <laughs> That's the first year I was like, oh, these can actually be like cool. <laughs> Maybe they're trying to like do away with the vaporwave trend that's taken over like every marketing company everywhere this whole year. <laughs> it just tried to stop it. Like now, no more. But it, which, it was such news this year that even my computer geek husband like said to me, do you know what the colors of the year are? I was like, of course I do, but yeah. why do you know? <laughs> <laughs> it was the two colors, I think, right? Everybody was like, oh my God. Um, I think it also was because it was like coming out of the pandemic type of thing. Mm -hmm. Is this the first time they've done two, two I colors? Think... Oh, no, no, no. they, uh, they did one a few years ago where it was, uh, but they used it as a gradient. Like a... Yeah. They I didn't don't... necessarily they use it as a gradient, but they did offer two and they did offer that as an option, but it was, it was yeah, uh, they've ever done two colors for the year. 2014, they, they picked two colors of it. I love that we all know so much about this. <laughs> okay, not to get, <laughs> else not get too nerdy. 
But Sometimes it can be detrimental to the industry because then you see everybody jumping ship, selecting those colors or like variations of it. So I understand the idea behind it and the value and the commercial aspect of it, but I feel like everybody gets too fixated on what is the next color of the year, the next pattern of the year, the next run of the year. And before we know it, everybody's like in this sea of sameness all the time. I mean, you can experience that way even with the car brands and all that. Like all the logos now are black and everything looks the same. And it's like, I don't know, it's like, it can be dangerous uh, to the process of design because people will start thinking less, therefore <laughs> designing less. And in Dutch position, I'd say what's really interesting is how people choose to use the color. So if you look at the inspiration videos from past years, it's quite remarkable because people basically take the color as a launch point and they do something that makes it their own. So actually I find that pretty fascinating. <laughs> Just seeing it going back to like your comment about how much we know about Pantone, um, you know, it's it's intense when um, you start kind of identifying what color you feel for the day. <laughs> You're like, I'm feeling a I'm feeling a four eight five C today. I'm feeling pretty bold. <laughs> <That's amazing. laughs> Does anybody else do that? <laughs> Our, uh, a channel just for that on Slack. <laughs> That's when your geek mode really comes up, Chris. <laughs> It's yeah. there. It's there. Whenever Pantone would announce the new colors, I used to immediately make like the wallpaper for my computer and just have it cycle through. And it's like a Pantone chip with the color, and it'll say like, Pantone color of the year 2000, whatever. Um, <laughs> I used to just have a play through, like on like a three minute timer each one. So that's why I happen to remember the task. This the last time we had two colors one year. I had a client one time back when I worked in nonprofit. So of course they were like a trustee with all this money and we had to be very accommodating and they picked a fabric Pantone color and were astonished and very upset when the printer was like, this isn't a Pantone ink color. And I had to explain that to them so far into the process. And I was like, we can't do this. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't right. <laughs> Has anyone played the Pantone card game? I've oh. seen it. Everyone How just perked up a little. <laughs> um, so essentially it's like you have the color swatches as little cards and you're, you only have like a certain amount of time and you have a couple hints. Um, and so it has to be like a cartoon character and you can only use like four oh. color chips. And so you put down like blue, yellow, red and you stack it in an order to make a, a, the shape of a character. And it's like, oh, Marge Simpson, you know? And so like, you're trying to build oh, out sick. like, or like the little South Park guys where it's like the little hat and then like a big fat red one. And it's like, okay, Cartman from South Park. And so you build like a Blinken and it's a big mm. hat on top of a beard. So, but you only can use so many chips and so many colors. That's fun. If yeah. someone is getting, all right, I'm, that's going to my Christmas list. Real quick. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if we'll make it in time. <laughs> yeah, true, that's true. <laughs> so Ryan, I didn't believe you, but you're absolutely right. They did two colors in 216. It was like Serenity or something, right? Yeah, they had it yeah, again. It was the touch position. They had uh, uh, rose quartz and Serenity. So That's it. Like, you know, it's funny. <laughs> as soon as those came out, obviously we we spoke to it. A lot of people jump on that immediately. As soon as that happened, I started seeing like you know those like the big mugs that are advertised as like Super Bowls that like, with like a Tupperware top. They started doing like Serenity and like uh, the rose quartz, or whatever as like a pairing on that. I was like, okay, well that, that happened really quickly. They jumped on that. I bet they, Dribble is going nuts too. I haven't actually checked on that. Yeah. I want to, um, I want to shift the conversation real quick. Has anybody used Photoshop's new neural filters yet? Not yet. I, uh -huh. so Randy, I saw you give the thumbs up. I did it for the first time really this week and it is terrifying. Oh no! It is definitely what cheating. What is it? What is it? So it, it basically does everything for you, and actually, it's it's not perfect, but it certainly does save a lot. It's certain things that for retouching, it'll save a lot of time. Oh, it was it, if, is it like if there's someone running across the beach, you can like it redoes the background. It's like content aware or something, or no? So there's content aware, and that's it's part of that same AI platform. But what? Right. The neural filters are it's like if you kind of have like our profile shots right now our portraits you can actually you can do things like change eye direction you can 
You can de-age or increase age. You can add makeup or remove makeup. I mean, it. so we had a photo shoot where um, we had um, a younger infant who just looked a little bit on the sad side. You can actually toggle expression like surprise or happiness. And we were actually able to make the infant look just not as sad. <laughs> and it was, um, it was very impressive, but like equally terrifying. If, if anybody, uh, and I know plenty of you probably were on Adobe Max, they, they did a lot of, a lot of examples of it. And yeah, it's amazing. It is amazing. I mean, it's, it's truly amazing. And the whole expression thing was, was freaky because it, looked real i mean it was you know i mean i think just looking at a photo you wouldn't say well that was somebody who wasn't smiling who now is smiling um and i know that they're putting something i guess into the into the tags or whatever the image so that i mean the, the problem with it of course is that we're not going to be able to trust video and photo and <sighs> we're I don't know. I don't know what page everybody is on right now, but we're living through a, a really crazy time, and um, half the country believes one thing, the other half is believing something else, and uh, and now you know we're not going to be able to use photos as as proof of anything. Or <laughs> apparently they're putting something into the into the software, right, so that somebody could get down and say that's not the original photo; it's been altered. Yeah. But that, that is one of the things they're doing. It's pretty crazy. It's pretty crazy. That, that is one thing that was also called out if you look at the fine print that everything is meta tagged. So actually, uh, it is going to be a, a, next to impossible to strip that out. So you will be able to tell an alteration. In fact, there's a whole piece on that because apparently they've had pushback on that already. Which is technically great, except that, you know, as far as the average is being right. out there, no, no one's checking meta tags. And if and if some service decides to say, wait, whoa, whoa, that photo that's been going around the world a gazillion times is has been altered, you know, who who hear, we hear that maybe some serious ethical issues. Oh, that's that's what I think. That's what I think. Like us as designers, we're gonna have to we're gonna face a time of new change uh, to a perspective and a spectrum that we didn't picture before. Because now is the time where we're gonna be held accountable, right? Like we've been designing through the years doing whatever we want running x campaign it doesn't matter how it affects people as more as long as it can bring an impact right so now it's like okay now we need to dial it down now design needs to be more responsible right so i said mm -hmm. we have a level of accountability now that if we do it right we can put ourselves in a different position and we can have more equity in society but it can also go the other way so i think the ethical evaluation of the role of designers and our influence in the day-to-day -day of people's lives especially in this society that is trying to over-design itself, it's going to be pretty interesting in the next 10 years. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a responsibility that we have. I'll tell you an old stories. Uh, I, I had a, an opportunity years and years ago to, to study with a, um, a, a world-renowned designer. It was at the, I, I think at the time it was Maine College of Art or Portland College of Art. I think they've changed their name since then. But Bruno Manguzzi was, was teaching a course. I was able to, to work with him for a week and he was talking about in Italy that his parents, he said, you know, my parents don't trust us designers anymore. Now this has got to be going way, this is going way back. And, and he was laughing and he said, you know, when they bought wine, the shape of the bottle indicated the quality of the wine. So they knew, oh, I'm buying a good bottle of wine because, you know, the bottle itself indicated that's a finer wine and a cheaper wine you know, was in a different shape bottle. And he said, and then us designers came around and started designing beautiful labels for shitty wine. <laughs> and my parents now are like, I don't know. I, I look at the labels and I mean, I, I'm sure as designers, we're all guilty, right? I mean, I can get lured into a really, you know, mediocre bottle of wine if it's got a great label. You know, it's like, oh, that looks great. And then you go like, yeah, it wasn't so good. But the designer, you know, I mean, look at it. if somebody asked me to design a label and I didn't like the wine, you know, I'm sure I, I would try to design a great looking label. The design, um, the design makes it taste better, I swear. <laughs> like, well, yes. I there's something about expectation, I think, too. You know, if you've ever gone to a restaurant <laughs> and had somebody be a really crappy waiter or waitress and that just affects the meal right but if you have like a subpar meal but the experience was great it makes the food taste better i feel design does the same thing 
Yeah. You know, when you unbox yeah. something that's been really done in the product, maybe not be as superior, you still get that. Um, I, I just want to reaction. point out that while I'm talking about fine wine, I'm drinking Miller. <laughs> the highlight. <laughs> Very nice. Um, well, this, this has been great. Um, we're actually, we're going to have some more time to um, continue to, uh, conversations, but we're going to, we're going to move along with our presentation and uh, get our guest speakers kicked off. So um, with that being said, um, I'm going to kind of just uh, talk about the setup for tonight. Um, let me share my screen again. And we're doing something a little bit unique uh, today for our community meeting. So um, we we're talking about how our community meetings, you know, normally we get to do these in person. We get to kind of see each other, you know, you can break away and kind of mingle and have one-on-ones with people or in groups. So we're trying to see how best we can do that with today's meeting. So today we are joined uh, by our very own Nancy Rousseau, who is our design for good director um, and Randy Herbertson, uh, who's going to be talking about our freelancer forum. Um, and they're gonna give us a quick high level overview of what they're gonna be going over. And then after that, um, we're gonna have breakout rooms to kind of join them in a more intimate and exclusive uh, setting. Um, and we're also going to keep this um, current room open and we're gonna call that the lounge. So if you guys wanna just continue to hang out and chat, uh, talk more about neural filters and bottles of wine, <laughs> we, can, we can continue to do that here as well. Um, so that's kind of how we're going to set this up and we're going to have kind of, um, you know, instruction on how to join those breakout rooms. Um, if you already kind of know which room you want to join, um, you can actually uh, put that into the chat as well in case um, where there's any technical difficulty and we can actually assign you, um, but you should be able to freely join uh, whichever room that is preferred. Um, so um, we're going to start off and I'd like to introduce uh, Nancy. Nancy Rousseau is the founder and principal designer of Rousseau Graphics, um, a branding and document design firm in its 35th year. Owner of Creatives Roundtable, a creative business accountability group, and co-leader of Fly Female Founders, a New York-based nonprofit for educating women for business growth. She has been a sustaining member of the AIGA for more years than she can count. Uh, so Nancy, the floor is yours. Okay. Hi, everyone. Am I sharing my presentation now, or are we just doing that in the, the groups? Um, when we go join the uh, breakout yep. rooms, you'll be okay. able to have that. So um, I'm the Design for Good uh, chair with Sarah, who's here somewhere. I can't see her right now. Um, we, are, we do the civic initiatives and things that support beyond the design community, but include the design community. So this year we're doing Get Out the Vote, Healthcare for All, um, design thinking workshop and a makeathon. And Sarah brought in the makeathon last year. It was a great success. Um, and we supported a bunch of nonprofits with it. Um, design thinking is a new workshop that we're introducing this year. We have a great workshop lead. Her name is Trisha Oaken. And that will also be focused on nonprofits. Healthcare for All is an initiative that um, I started. And we're trying to get it off the ground. It's a little slow going, um, but it's a, basically a poster initiative to show your desires for healthcare and what you think that represents healthcare in the United States. And then get out the vote is something that we need to do every single year. So we just engage the community by posting in social areas on whatever's going on in this year's elections. That's about it. Awesome. Thank you, Nancy. Yeah. So if you guys are interested in hearing more about this, um, the uh, Design for Good team has a pre presentation ready. Uh, so when we go into those breakout rooms, uh, they'll be able to go more in depth into that. All right. Next is Randy Herbertson. Um, Randy is a recognized brand strategist, conceptor, and creative director with over 20 years of marketing and innovation experience in the client, agency, and media worlds from entrepreneurial to corporate environments. Randy has worked in the WPP and Omnicom agency networks, Condé Nast Publications, Allied Demec, and E&J Gallo. 
Starting in 2004, Randy has worked in the boutique agency world, owning and operating two firms, including the Visual Brand, founded in 2013. He has a strong expertise in social media, digital innovation, packaging, industrial, and environmental design. Randy will discuss how he finds and utilizes freelance talent for his agency, including tips for getting noticed, an opportunity to turn short-term into long-term engagements or permanent positions. Uh, Randy, the floor is yours. I think you just gave my preview there, Chris. Uh, <laughs> so uh, as, as Chris has called out to you, know, I've been a... Oh, Brandy, sorry. Randy, you can hit me. Sorry, now I'm unmuted. Sorry, now you can hear me. I was going to say, Chris just uh, did my, my prelim there. So. As Chris has called out, um, I've been an agency owner since 2004, and I have worked uh, through those years with a, a large number of staff and also freelancers. And so what I'm really here is to share sort of the things that work for me and what work for a lot of my peers who are agency leaders, both in the large and small agency world. And so I look forward to talking to anybody who wants to hear more about that. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that, Randy. I actually muted you when I meant to mute myself, so that's on me. <laughs> sorry about that. Okay, so um, at this time, um, we are going to take another quick kind of intermission. If anybody wants to get up and uh, refill your beverages, um, need to take a quick break. Um, um, at this time, we're going to be able to answer any extra questions that you might have. Um, but uh, here's the setup. So um, basically room number one is going to be the design for good room. Um, that's where you'll be able to um, talk with Nancy and her team on the design for good initiatives. Room number two will be our freelancer forum with Randy. Um, so join uh, him and hearing more about the details and tips and tricks for um, freelancing and agency networking. So uh, yeah, uh, as, as of this time, we can just kind of um, catch up some more, talk some more, and then um, segue into those rooms. And we're going to get started in about eight minutes. So at 7.50 is when those rooms will go underway and those presentations will kick off. Yeah, I um, just quickly want to say if, if people are interested in both, like we're definitely going to be sending out the recordings later. So yeah. Um, you know, feel free to hop in whichever um, and you won't miss it. We'll make sure that you guys can view that content later. And then um, I guess, Kelly, are they, are the breakout rooms released? Um, no, I, I think we're going to release them at 7.50. I mean, I think we could just do it now. And then as people are done getting their little breaks, you know, just give them a couple minutes. Sure. Um, I just want to make sure that everybody can see it or that we start um, figuring out who to place. So, awesome. and, so, yeah, so I don't know if you want to go to the Nash, you have the page with like the screenshots, right? Yeah. Yeah. So if anybody needs um, to kind of poke around the UI of the Zoom, you should be able to see some of these options um, between toggling all of the different rooms. And again, if you have any questions or if you just want to request which room to be in, uh, Kelly can direct you uh, in that way as well. So just yes. uh, let us know and yeah. Yeah. Keep Feel free to and... join just join the room you want. And then if you don't have that option, uh, feel free to write in the chat or let me know and I'll put you in the room that you'd like to be in. Going back to our neural filters chat, I have a theory that one day Hollywood uh, stars are just gonna license their, their face and be just digitally imposed into act yep. like stunt doubles. <laughs> Did, were the neural filters what was used in the um, New, those New York Times? Um, you know, there was a, a series of photos that nobody, it, they were all composite, but they look like real people. Do you know if they did that using the neural filters? It might have been that, or maybe the uh, deep fake stuff that was going around. I don't know if that's the. I don't know if it was the same thing, but it could have been, yeah, it could have been the neural filters. It was crazy. Yeah. You know, there's already like e-influencers where they're not like, you don't even need the celebrities doing that in the future. They'll just make celebrities. Yeah, they're AI. Yeah, they're like already there. But like, honestly, we, we as people have been editing photos since we started taking photos. Like if you think back to any photo you've ever seen 
of a Native American, like back in the like what was it, like early 1900s, late 1800s, those were all staged. You know, they had radios, they had items that came from settlers, but they like moved all that stuff out to not show how they were integrating with objects like that. So we've, we've already had these things. Yeah, but the, the challenge that you face with this kind of technology is this is, you have system, systems with complexity and complex systems, right? Through the industrial revolution, you had everything that man did was through like an extension of their capabilities. But now when you have a system, when you have artificial intelligence integrated into the decision-making process of any particular task that you want, you have first unforeseen variables that are going to be introduced into the mix that you cannot plan for. And number two, the level of potential scenarios that can arrive from anything that gets done through artificial intelligence is something that we've, we don't have as individual humans the capability of processing and internalizing, right? So it's like, yes, all these technologies to get certain things existed, but someone had to do them. Now is not the case. So now when you have things like, for instance, the film industry has been using mocap forever, which is motion capture, right? That's when you have digital doubles. Then you have the story that's like, okay, let's create 3D versions of the faces of people. Now let's do 3D scanning, started with the matrix and then move, move along, right? So now you have a stereo 3D scanning and all these technologies. The challenge that you're going to face once you have neural networks is that in the entertainment industry, first it's going to kill a lot of jobs. Um, and some industries are going to transform the jobs in the film industry is going to kill a lot of them. And also the fact is like now traceability and the, you have more capabilities to create more things with this technology, but it's more difficult again to foresee any particular scenario in which uh, this could bring negative consequences. And I think like, it is great that we're having artificial intelligence, but I don't think society has been preparing itself to deal with the consequences that something like this is gonna bring to society. Um, even, even in the graphic design field, right? You have, uh, well, as a graphic designer, I can do this 10 times faster, I can do this X times faster, yada, yada, yada. Well, you have people that haven't been adapting to how these technologies evolve, right? And for instance, processing capabilities in the last 45 years has more than 12,000 times X, right? So like the processing capabilities that you had in the 60s, is 12,000% higher and more efficient than what it was in the past. So what now, the biggest challenge that we have been facing is how can you process this technology really fast, right? That's basically the gating item. Now when you have technologies like 5G, when you have 100% speed and 100% less latency, now what you're talking about, well, we can create a lot of things really, really fast, but we don't know what the consequences or what the result is gonna is gonna be. So um, I don't think we are ready, like especially designers. And it is funny because this is happening at the same time that society is over itself, right? Like anybody now that has a small business, big business, doesn't matter. They want the best design possible, right? They wanna compete with Apple. They wanna look like Apple, they wanna compete with Nike. So the challenge with this, like as designers, I don't think we have been preparing ourselves for A, the ethical, B, the technological implementation, and C, the scalability of systems of this nature. So uh, we're entering really interesting times. And I think the pandemic was the, and I think Mark Cuban said this the best way, the single best point for people to do their best, uh, to create new businesses, to learn new things and stuff like that. And I, I think a lot of people haven't been doing that. And when they go back to work, they're going to experience a completely different environment. And that can be dangerous. So I think having a pandemic that has stopped everything and now because of the needs of companies, we have to go through systems of automations and stuff like that. A lot of people are losing their jobs and they don't even know it yet, right? Um, so it's like, how is society going to be preparing itself and how us as designers are going to be able to like manage that in a way that is sustainable? It's going to be interesting. It's going to be pretty interesting in my opinion. I agree with you, Julio, in many aspects, but I also, again, this is a tale as old as time. We've been doing this as humans since we've been humans, starting with agriculture, thinking about how we utilize plastics without thinking about the consequence. Like, I think this is something that we do over mm -hmm. and over again, and this is another facet of it. Well, that's, that's the trick, right? Right now, we are not going to be the ones doing it. That is the whole variable there. Like, in the past, we, we used to do all these things, but now a system, a complex system with 
all the faults that we have in our thinking. For instance, there is this book about this lady. Uh, she, she, the book is about basically how statistics have been killing women, right? When you consider a car, a uh, anything that is not met, meant for women is using the statistics of the average American, which is a white male in the 25 to 34 years old, right? So when you consider a car, for instance, the, the seating, right, that you have, like the depth of the seat can be extremely dangerous if you don't consider the variables of women. But if you're not targeting women with your car selling, well, women are still gonna be buying the car, even though you didn't factor them as part of the equation. Now, once you introduce all these variables that we don't know about or we are not aware of, and now a system is doing that instead of us, that's when things become interesting because again, we've been doing it, but now it's, that's the thing, like we're out of the equation in the process of doing it. We're gonna be basically- Not completely. Not Someone compl still has to set the parameters. Someone still has to push go. Like I, it's not completely out of our hands. Correct, but that's what is tricky because if, for instance, us as designers, the people that have the most power in how society moves, whether we like it or not, and I'm talking designers across the board, like people who solve problems, if we have never been using really ethical foundations to define how we arrive to certain conclusions and how we define certain processes, all these biases that we have, whether they're cultural, financial, whatever you want to, we're gonna instill that into things like neural systems, right? Or machine learning systems. Now, to put into an example, there was this, this, this study that they were running on like the implementations of, of machine learning and, and computer vision for neural, neural, neural networks, right? They were introducing variables, showing with, uh, pictures of, of women uh, in a kitchen, right? A bunch of pictures, front, back, side, profile, whatever you want. After they started running the system, they realized, well, why are there so many men in this, in this, in this system? Well, the way that the algorithm was, was fed, they were feeding a lot of images that didn't consider certain groups, like women with short hair. Well, they consider too many women with short hair and stuff like that. The system wasn't able to identify those capabilities. Also, the system didn't show a lot of African-American women in the kitchen, right? So it's like all these variables that we're introducing into these systems are getting in. We Again, like we say, we don't know that we're biased towards it. And now we have system processing that data and executing upon them. So it's like, how are we going to be able to now, after like hundreds of years of not creating ethical processes, going to like absorb all this technology and be able to like, oh, hold on. Now everything we design needs to be really thought of because it's not only us doing it, something else is doing it. And if we, like one small negative variable can end up killing someone across the board, right? Like even, if, even in, a, in, a, in a production line, right? You say, well, I didn't screw this properly. Well, it goes through the system, goes through the system. Well, it, it is my responsibility to check that screw. It was your responsibility. You let it a little bit loose. Over 40,000 miles of the car running, sorry, 400 miles, let's say, of the car running, because of the vibration, the screws started getting looser and looser and looser and looser. You know, so and it's dead, right? So it's like kind of the same principle about systems of this nature that are complex systems that are self-sustained. It's like if we don't if we don't set the foundations for this properly, since we don't know any potential scenarios because there are so many, we may end up in a really, I don't want to sound so negative, but potentially catastrophic environment for someone. Um, so that's where to me, this is going to be really interesting. And that's what I think like designs, designers, instead of learning more about like, oh yeah, AI or this and that, like start learning about the ethical uses of it. Like Facebook had a problem, I think it's 2015, when they were launching her, their, their machine learning system, they were developing a machine learning system that was going to create its own language. And you can check that online. Mm -hmm. Supposedly, again, supposedly this was proven to be correct. So I may be saying something that is incorrect, but theory says it, it is right. They let two computers run over the weekend to talk to each other, right? Everything was going good. When they came back on Monday, the two computers were talking a completely brand new language and they couldn't understand anything what the computer were doing. So the computer basically isolated themselves. They isolated the human factor and the accountability of the human processes to talk on their own. They had to shut down the system. So that's a small example of one of the companies that we say, you know what they're doing. 
what is going to happen once this technology becomes cheaper and more accessible? And a lot of people that don't know what they're doing make a lot of small mistakes. How is that going to scale across the board? Because a lot of us as designers either are thinking about how we bring value to a customer or how we make something pretty, right? But a lot of the, what is the social responsibility of it is almost never part of the equation. And that's what I'm really interested to see where things are going to go. But this is going to be... Yeah. There is going to be, I think there's going to be a lot of lawsuits related to design in the next 10 years. Mm. And also because just by having this technology, whether the designers have been responsible or not, there is a lot of potential liability that people are going to be unethical and just sue for it, right? It's like, oh, the design didn't account for this. Therefore, I'm going to sue you. So I think we as designers need to get ahead of the curve on that. And I think like the visual design field is one of the ones that is the more... The one least developed. Like architects need to deal with this, like automation systems, because an architect cannot make a mistake. You can literally kill a bunch of people by one simple mistake, right? Industrial designers, they're the ones that have it the toughest. Because especially on the consumer end, people are really picky about what they pay money for, right? But when it comes to visual design, it's really cheap to make a mistake that can have consequences and not be held accountable for it. So I now weird though. Huh? Like we're already, but like, I think we're there. We're already there. It's not like a future problem. It's already a current problem. Oh. And we don't even need AI to get that smart for it to be a problem. That's what I'm saying. But it's like, now once AI is doing it on its own with all our mistakes that are already in the mix, like, how are we going to deal with it? Because it's going to get really interesting to me. <laughs> just going to sweep it under the rug like we typically do and just wait for it to blow up. <laughs> that's going that's, to that's gonna be tricky though. That's yeah, gonna, I mean... I think there are helpful things in place. Like even at my job, I like post a, a link, like, you know, we're working with some spooky machine learning stuff where it like, you know, it'll recognize mm -hmm. the type of person that's walking in a mall. And, you know, um, later on, it's going to be like serving, you know, different types of ads, depending on who's looking like, but ethically, you know, there are things like GDPR, thankfully that were put in place preemptively, like a few years ago that, you know, we're all trying to file you know, follow ISO 5700 compliance, like things like that. But mm -hmm. I think, you know, lawmakers, you know, as designers, yes, we'll have to be very ethical about it. Like, you know, putting in different preference settings and being like, oh, if you want to, you can opt out and understanding that process. Like at least from, you know, in my head, like a UX designer perspective, it's like, if you don't offer those things, that's pretty unethical. And you need to think about those things and offer them to users. But um, to opt out. But here's the part that is interesting with that particular point. It's like, well, that is true, but here's where we are completely responsible. And that's what I think like us as visual designers, we really need to examine what we're doing because it's okay, you can always opt out, cool. Go into your Gmail and check all the things that you're signed up for because you wanted to check, you wanted to check like an ad that you saw giving you an audio book or a PDF or something like that. Check it. Yes, I understand that is the only medium of entry, but it's like, well, you can always opt out, but we're gonna let these like bait and switch protocol because that's basically what social media has been really good at. It's like, let's give you like this really good teaser. You give me all your information and then I'm gonna bombard you with whatever nonsense I can bombard you with. It's like, yes, you can always opt out, but it's like, if, you, if we continue the same protocol, right, and we say 10 years from now, well, you, I can opt out, but you send me a PDF. Like, you give me a PDF, I'll give you my email, whatever. Now you're sending me information, I go buy a product, and that product gets someone killed. Uh, are you liable for it? I don't think laws have established that properly, right? So it's like now, it's like... Again, going back to the car industry, that car industry makes a mistake. They're calling cars back, right? They're like dumping millions, if not billions of dollars solving that problem and trying to address that. If a campaign goes out and a bunch of people get killed, who's liable? Like, how can we clearly define who's liable? Was it the graphic designer? Was it the company? Was it the customer? Is it everybody? How will we define the accountability? How many years are gonna get out of jail? What is the fine? Like all these tiny details that because of the way that our business operates um, need to be addressed or else. And GDPR is good 
But we also need to consider GDPR started in Europe because we have a lot of lawmakers that don't even know how Facebook makes its money. That was painful to watch. So like, <laughs> since you cannot leave it to the lawmakers, you have to put it on the designers. But if the designers are not minding it because they are trusting that the lawmakers know what they're doing, which is basically what happened. Without GDPR in Europe, we probably have been ruining the same things we've been doing like for the last five years prior. So it's like, okay, Europe, Europe did the responsible thing there. But because yeah. of some of these things that we found through that time period, that's when Facebook and Amazon and Google went into the Senate hearings. It was painful to watch those Senate hearings. Those guys don't even know how a company that is basically the one of the the 10 companies that hold over 40% of the S&P 500, two of these companies are in a hearing and you don't know how those companies make money. These companies are moving the stock market, literally, and you don't know how they make money. So as a result of it, you can hold a designer liable for it right now, and your lawmakers don't know how the business model operates. So it's like, who is liable right now? We don't I don't know. think it would ever be a designer though. And I think like, no, it'd be very rare for a small company to have the resources to make any grounds on this, right? To, to make no, it. No. On the contrary, though, on the contrary, that's that's what is dangerous. Because like, now, like, for instance, like Jordan said, the company he works for has access to this technology. I bet his company is not making $50 billion a year or $50 million a year potential. So it's like, that's the issue with these kinds of technology. Now, technology has become really democratic. So the access to it, is going to increase by the year. And that's where I want to know where things are going to end. If Jordan's company is using a product, right, that ends up, what, however they use the product, right, it ends up killing a bunch of people. The, the legal argument is going to be between the product, the people who made that product, and potentially mm -hmm. the company. But my main point is more about how when you're talking about things like this, it's very much like white collar crime. And then you're digging into a whole other can of worms because people who commit white collar crimes don't seem to be made accountable for those crimes. Like the guys that did Enron got like, one guy got like five years. Oh, Nobody no. else got that money back. The people that got robbed didn't see any justice and the people that committed the crime didn't. Mm have to deal with justice and it's gotten only worse over the years that people that are committing these kinds of high level crimes that cost millions and millions of dollars and can cost plenty of lives they get out of it because of power prestige and money and it's disgusting so then then basically what you're telling me is that we're doomed because these are yes. the people who I, I'm are, kind of I'm an optimistic nihilist, Julio. I don't know if you ever knew that, but uh, <laughs> I, I believe humans have the capability to not destroy themselves, but they'll do it anyways. Um, yeah, yeah I mean, I think it's the same problems. It's the same problems over and over again. But the tech is changing, and the speed is changing, and and the effects of it is changing. But I don't think we're going to see change in how it's happened, which sucks. But I don't think the onus will be on the designer. It's on the designer to make the ethical choice to do it or not do it. But I don't think they'd be held in court. But we should. The designer? Yeah. Hmm. Like, for instance, I want a company, right? Mm -hmm. And let's not even get it complicated. There's many of the companies that we work for that have worked for businesses that are shady and everybody knows those businesses are shady, like, right? So yes, there is the ethical responsibility of taking the business or not taking it, but there is also the fact of you have a real risk dynamic, which basically establishes if I don't take the job, someone else is going to take it and I don't make the money, right? So it's like, considering that society moves that way uh, because... Social systems operate by, behind that dynamic because of how economics are defined, if you will. It's like, the businesses, like, there is more shady companies than honorable companies. And we've been finding this out over the years, right? Like, even the companies that we love, mm -hmm. most of them are pretty shady. Like, really, really shady. I think the worst part is the major companies that own all the other companies. You don't even know that you're supporting their products like Nestle. Yeah. They're privatizing yeah. water. People don't understand how many things are actually owned by Nestle that isn't chocolate. Correct. Correct. So I say now 
to me, this is this is to me why. And maybe I'm thinking more about designers outside of the visual field, like the other type of designers. But even like the, the visual, ones. even the visual designers, because that's how we move the markets, right? It's like, well, the iPhone wouldn't be the iPhone without the presentation and all the marketing crap they did and all that, right? It's like, if I gave the phone to a bunch of people without the hype before the first phone was launched, I can bet you my life that phone would have been as popular as it is right now. Because that's designer psychology. But again, but that's that's where to me it's like this is this is my problem with visual design lately, right? It's like everybody's running to make it pretty, to look at the best cool thing that is ever, to be ahead of trends or set the trends. Cool. You're not an artist, you're getting paid to solve a problem. But this is where the dynamic becomes interesting because solving a problem for who, right? From my perspective, you have to solve a problem that can get benefit to your customer, their end consumer, but also stay maintain a level of sustainability to our society. But most businesses don't operate that way. So, well, solving the problems for the company that hired me, which is they want something that looks cool, I give it to them, I get paid. I don't care what happens with it. I don't care if someone gets killed or not. That is not my problem. That's a company because they gave me the idea or, or we arrived to the idea together. So to me, say, under that principle, it's really easy to be irresponsible as a designer because you're like, well, I gave them the value they needed. And, you know, this is not a company that ever say that they're working towards a better environment or a better future, or more sustainability, right? It's like they sell headphones, right? So it's like, well, or even the case with Apple. Just, I'm to ask you what your thoughts were on that, on like the new initiatives they're doing. As a company, I hate Apple uh, from the perspective of how their business model operates, how they do business, how they establish business, how they position their products. The only thing I really appreciate about them is not even their visual design, their industrial design is second to none. But as a company, they're extremely unethical. They are, they love inflating. They work on the foundation of the most basic way of segmenting people to the point that almost I feel like they're treating me like a pawn because it's tribalism, right? It's like this principle, say God said it best. You go to an airport and you check how many people have dirty Macs, you're going to see none. How many people have dirty laptops? Almost everybody because they don't care about it. So it's like this concept of we are a tribe. Whether they're cool or not, it doesn't matter. But we are a tribe as a result of it. Well, this is the way, the way that we behave which I have no problem with because that's the whole principle of creating a brand, right? You don't create it for everybody. You create it for a specific group. What I have a problem with is that they know who the consumer is, right? And yes, they market to like, you know, all these beautiful people and, you know, these edgy people and all that. But they know the people that buy their phones in large are the, the people who do landscape, are the people who do this, the people that, that work in a factory and they sell a phone for $1,000, and given the margins that they make, there's no reason for them to sell a phone from $1,000. And people say, oh, yeah, who you know, you know the product development. I'm like, I did a lot of a study on the product. And the best example is, well, look at the trends. Everybody was going for a $1,000 phone until four years, three, no, three years ago. Now everybody's scaling down. Right, because they're like, oh, well, nobody wants to pay for another phone. The phones are lasting longer and people are ex expecting more quality from the phone. So it's like, clearly, selling the phone for $1,000 wasn't a matter of, and people talk about, oh, the technology now is cheaper. That is an absolute lie. They use the same manufacturers. The only thing they have been doing is implementing better processes. The materials are about the same. At the end of the day, you're using aluminum for most of the products. It's one of the cheapest alloys ever. But the point being is like, they know that. And they're using the concept of the tribe along with the fame the Steve Jobs had. And when people talk about like, oh yeah, because it's better, everything looks better in a Mac. No, that was up until 1996 when the monitors they had because of the technology they had on the monitors was better. And if we were to say thank you to Apple for things like the retina display, you have to thank LG because they are the ones who created the technology and they licensed that technology to Apple. So to me, say like the argument of how Apple are superior products is like that is a lie, right? You have a great product. Huh? 
it used to be about the operating system more than I think the hardware. But I mean, that's not even their most egregious affront. You know, the fact that their working conditions were causing their workers to commit suicide at a, mm -hmm. at a ridiculous oh, rate. And yeah, how they, well, go, they don't allow for phone repair. But I mean, that's what you're saying isn't just Apple specific. That's a whole problem of the cell phone industry and this planned obsolescence. Like mm. you could put the, all of those companies together and light them on fire because they're all doing it. Yeah. 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 And, and this is what is, what is tricky. Like, well, and, and I can go in my high horse and say, oh well, yeah, these people. And it's like, the reality of the matter, and this is, this is what problems have to scale to, a global scale. The reality of the matter is like everybody in that position is going to do the exact same thing. Doesn't matter how moral you are. If your idea is to grow a business, it's going to get to a point where you have to go to sleep knowing that someone may have died because of your product, whether because of an accident, a malfunction, or just working conditions and business of that nature, right? So it's like, well, then the problem is a matter of how society operates. Cool, but we are part of the system that keeps society. So we need to start rethinking how this chunk of the system works, how that can play into society, because at the end of the day, isn't that our job to solve problems? That's the whole definition of what designers. So it's like a lot of making things pretty and new trends and pastels and this and that. It's like, when are we gonna solve the most fundamental problem, which is designing in a way that doesn't obliterate the planet because that's the only thing that we are doing, right? So even to your point, well, now, and everybody's like, oh yeah, cool, and everybody in La Land, now water is being openly traded in the stock market. What do you think is gonna happen in five years from now? What, yeah. this, what this is telling you is really rich people know that the problem with the water and all the things that we've been talking about, potential war about water, is coming. So they need to get that asset really locked so someone can get a ton of money. But we don't pay attention to it. To me, say, as designer, there is the aspect of surviving, right? Because I cannot say, now you need to become the ethical uh, police force, right? No, you can't do that because you have to survive. But say, we also need to be keeping an eye on these things and we need to have a position, right? Because if people say, oh yeah, this is politics, Remember, politicians are getting paid to solve problems of society. So everything that is politics is a problem that you need to pay attention to, except for whatever stupid discussion they have on their own terms. But everything that is being discussed in the floor of any government building is something relevant to you one way or the other, whether it affects you or not. So to me, say, holding these companies accountable, like I saw what... what, what uh, the I think it was the Senate asked. They say they want Amazon and Facebook to start indicating how they're using users' data. I'm like, okay, what is what is the group of really highly savvy tech guy that are going to be analyzing this and seeing this actually works? Number one. Number two. After this happens, because of the concept of too big to fail, if we discover that Amazon is doing whatever whatever you want they're doing, the government. They can try and break Facebook, and if they do, they're going to break all these companies. We know that's going to happen, which is also dangerous, right? So we need to be careful with it. But right now, let's say Amazon right now, and the government has stopped like, asking Facebook, asking for Facebook to be broken down. If we were to find that Amazon was doing a lot of unethical things, they are. Not, none of them super big, but all of them big enough to get attention, and over the compound of it, it becomes a massive problem. What is the government going to do? You cannot break that company. You break that company and you literally slash the stock market, right? In a country where we're in the middle of a pandemic pandemic, and 22% of the money ever printed in this country was printed in this year. So what are you gonna do? You can't do much. much. We can do, because again, this is, this is an issue that we've been facing constantly where People are paying for this to like Amazon's already doing terribly unethical things. Yep. Jeff Bezos made a ridiculous amount of money off of this pandemic, as did many companies and many rich people. While yep. everyone else suffered, like we see what happens. Yep. But I think I think we need to step up as designers. How there is a lot of ways a lot of them can massively fail, but it's like if we stay. 
complacent. Was, yeah, supporting the system in the way that we're doing it, because again, since 10 years ago, designing everything wasn't a thing, right? Like the owner of a pizza shop will come, I need a logo. A logo, they print a sign and they're done. They don't need anything else, right? Now they need an strategist. And just to compete, I'm not talking about like even be the biggest, just to compete. I need someone to run my social media. I need to learn SEO. I need to do this. I need to do that. I need to do that. So we are magnifying the amount of things that get into the mix while giving these companies more leverage and more money, right? So you say, we know that the government is not going to break it. And we know society at large doesn't properly potentially understand exactly what's happening. We have a better understanding. Well, we need to start figuring out ways to solve this problem because A, a lot of us are going to run out of jobs because of it over the long haul, especially through things like automation. Because you can say, oh yeah, there's a lot of design, graphic designers in, in the world, right? But how many of them are good designers? Mm -hmm. How many good are great designers? And how many of them have connections? If you start automating a lot of things that can be done really cheaply through a software, you pay $29.99 a month, well, a lot of people are going to lose their jobs. It's, and it happens. I mean, it's I, happened, right? Correct. Middle America. Like, automation took all those people's jobs. They're mad. They think it's immigrants, but they were fed a false narrative to believe that on correct. purpose. Correct. Um, I think, I, and again, Julio, I 100% agree with you, right? Like, I totally do. And I think designers, I don't think designers can solve it, but I think designers could have a great impact. We're trained to communicate. We are trained to persuade. No. We're trained to provide a lot of information simply and concisely. However, there's a lot of psychology you have to combat. There's a lot of narrative that's been fed to people. If we still have people that believe the earth is flat, yeah. what are we? <laughs> like, so yep. not to say we shouldn't try, but I think it's, it's just so complicated. It's yep. so complicated, and I think it's very difficult to even educate other designers about the power that they might have and also, like, what's a template of how to use it. Correct. Correct. But and It's possible. And, you know, and to your point, that is the critical aspect. Like, well, a lot of designers don't even know that this problem exists or that they are part of it. So it's like, <laughs> so they now what? It's coming. They yeah, so, it's coming. This is gonna be interesting. To me, say, my biggest fear has always been this. And now is, it keeps me up at night. It's like, the only legacy that I care about is competence, right? I want to leave this planet with everybody that I touch knowing that I was a competent individual. That is the only thing I care about, like on the long haul, okay. outside of family and all that. So to me, it's like, now, you have to learn so many things to keep up and I'm fine with it because I'm comfortable with the learning process. The challenge is- It's time too. Yeah. And the challenge connected to it is number one, it's like a lot of things are changing. You have to stay relevant by learning those things. But a lot of these things are actually relevant, right? Like for instance, using AR for social media. Love AR, been working on things related to AR for like a long time because mostly like video game stuff and details of that nature. It's like Facebook is not giving you spark for you to develop AR, for you to look good or whatever it is, right? <laughs> that is you're the, We're getting the, into your data. You see being used to collect a lot of data of the applications of it so they can find a new market. So to me, it's like, well, now I need to learn Spark if I want to run, like, I don't know, social media. But this is irrelevant because after three years, five years, people are going to move on to the next shiny object. So it's like, <sighs> you're spending so much time to stay relevant on something that is going to become irrelevant so fast that it's like, well, it's not worth my time. But if I don't do it, then I lose leverage. That's so why you got to hire people. Huh? That's so why you got to hire people. I mean, what's interesting <laughs> yeah. is, is you're talking about before how technology has become so democratic because it's available to so many people more so than now than it's ever been before. But mm -hmm. at the same time, it's becoming very prohibitive. 
when you think of a small business person, like you're saying, having to understand SEO, having to understand how paid media works and social media and keeping up a presence and churning out content. Um, I think it's a lot, but in some aspects, there still lives this little flame of meritocracy. This little flame exists. If you have a product or a food or a service that is that good and it solves a problem that well, you can still survive without those things. Correct. But it's still made, like they're still finding a way to keep small business down. With all of these things you have to know now to market yourself successfully. Correct. And 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 this is this is like, you know, when I was referring to the part of, of accountability of the past for designers, like that's the part where like we've been extremely dangerous at. It's like, okay, we are killing businesses just because we're creating a lot of garbage for companies that do garbage but have more money to put themselves in the eyes of people. Right. So it's like that is that is self termination in the in the making, right? It's like let's imagine that from this perspective. Well, I have to digest. I like candies and I like cookies. Cool. I know I have to eat my grits. I'm gonna be feeling myself the idea that I need to eat cookies every day to stay happy because out of all the food that I eat, that is the only one that makes me happy. What is gonna happen in ten years? That is literally what we're doing with. Which was that? And he's like, you make it sound like it's a conscious choice, though. But that is it, not, in fact, the case. Our that, brains work against us. But that's that's what is extreme. That's where that's where to me when you mentioned that. That's where to me became even more radical because it's like this is this was my my fear. Like for instance, with Donald Trump, I said the guy is dangerous. Yeah. Yes. But the reason why he's more dangerous is because he doesn't know what he's doing. But someone who's listening to what he's saying is going to know what they're doing. So to me, it's like, if we're making these kinds of mistakes without knowing it, there is no plan behind it. It just happened to happen. Well, we know that society is not good at scaling itself down until something catastrophic happens, right? Massive war, famine, or something like that. That's the only time when we hit reset, right? So it's like, if we're doing this by mistake, and now we're going to bring technology that is going to amplify that by 100x in, and make it 100 times faster mm-hmm. by the time we get to even process the data. Not even process it, collect the data to say, this is what we're going to analyze. Uh, you may be extremely late for not only a lot of businesses, but a lot of sections of society. So you think... Even things like, okay, 5G. We know technologies usually start really expensive and they get cheaper, right? So 5G is going to open the door for a lot of processing relatively fast and re- relatively cheap aspect. Well, we know that are gatekeepers. So a lot of people cannot let that go to the projects, right? We cannot have 5G in the projects at the same time that we have in the rich neighborhood because, well, the rich people are the ones who help develop this technology through their higher taxes. That's the thing, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's like, if we keep behaving this way, and now we have technology that is going to be amplifying these, these, these perspectives, especially, I mean, even in a society we live right now, we're still struggling to acknowledge that, like, African-Americans were abused. These people are still arguing. And not only that, people are arguing against, like, Native Americans. I'm like, are you fucking serious? Like, right after Nazi Germany, like, that is, like, really right there a second, especially because... In the first 20 years after the arrivals of the pilgrims and everybody, they were working with the Native Americans to obliterate other Native Americans. And then they decided, okay, let's cut them off, right? So it's to be said, when you have a society, they're still trying to find common ground about things of this nature. And now all these biases over periods of time keep perpetuating through systems that can amplify that faster than we can. And we cannot foresee potential scenarios that are gonna unfold from it. You better get your seatbelt because this ride is going to be really interesting in the next couple of years. See, I think, though, that there are people that know what they're doing and understand what's happening, and they don't care because they want to profit off of it. So 
back when the industrial revolution happened, they did studies and people of that time said, this is going to affect the climate. They knew it then. And we got the data and we're still in denial. Correct. We don't teach in this country all of the terrible things this country has done. There's so many uneducated Americans, and, and I include myself, right? Like what I know about the terrible things our country, I scratch the surface of what I know. I have inklings and thoughts, but I can't say I've done a deep dive to really understand yep. all the things we've done in all these other countries and how we're just as bad as the people that we accuse of being bad, right? Yep. So how can we expect people to even begin to understand what's happening if they don't even have the foundation of a proper education to be in position to think of themselves through any other lens. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. No, we're going to be right. No, no, no. The reason uh, we either reinvent the way that we think and the way that we think about thinking or the computers are going to do it for us. Right. Like this is, this is an example. There is this guy. He is, from the people that I know of, he's the biggest champion of ethical uh, policies towards AI. He says this. This is an example. And you can you can type this online. You're going to find it. He says, okay, an AI system is nothing more than a, an efficient and efficacious system, right? Efficient because it tries to perform a task really fast in the most economical way. And efficacious because gets that task done really, really, really well. Okay. Let's say that we're introducing biases to this system and we say, computer, let's say that we have, we reached kind of the singularity and we have this super brain that controls everything, like what is true artificial intelligence. Because right now I don't think there is artificial intelligence yet, but that's a different conversation. So you centralize this artificial intelligence and that system you tell the, the system, say, the people who supposedly control, even though nobody's going to be able to, if it's an artificial intelligence, control this system, say, I want you to make all those people there that are showing a sad face, I need you to make them happy. Okay, the system is gonna go through this neural network, analyze, define patterns, do pattern recognition, uh, behavioral analysis, all you want. And the system concludes that the best way for me to make all these people look happy is to implant syringes in their faces and have things pull in their face so their expression changes. Right? That's really, that's the cheapest way to make someone look like they're happy, right? Like even the kids used to do that. You're sad, they do this, right? That's the fastest way to do it. So to me say, if we don't know how these systems are gonna arrive to these conclusions because the data is so much, and that's the reason why we need them in the first place, that's where the paradox happens. How are we gonna be able to make sure that these things get implemented in a way that is sustainable? Hi, friends. We're not. We can't. Hi. That's the problem. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm Hello. Sorry. Ellie and Jordan have been listening to Julio and I talk this entire time. Yeah, no. I assumed. The, the chat lounge became design ethics room. <laughs> hey, was that? Is it not the water cooler? I thought you guys were supposed to unload onto Jordan. All of yeah. Oh, I was absorbing all of that. And now I'm like, oh, we're, we're effed. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, the optimistic side of my nihilistic approach is that we have the potential to fix these things. We do. We have the ability, <laughs> knowledge, and the power, but we probably won't. All right. Positive that's where thinking. design for we good might. comes in. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey, where, where's our freelancer people? Um, oh, what's, um... I could, like, close the room it would give them 60 seconds Maybe yeah we'll let you gotta do flash the lights on them. Um, yeah <laughs> and somebody head over i can head i over can hop in really quick it's like Sorry, stop networking okay. click, 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 click. <laughs> yeah i feel like six they should give you options because 60 seconds is like not enough you're like oh no yeah <laughs> what happens after 60 seconds like Actually, you're just gone you just get flung out when i've oh, run, no. done the breakout rooms i have done it where i give people a two-minute warning and yeah. then I just say, okay, you're done. You're out of your room. Goodbye. I like the two minute warning. Two minutes would be good. Yeah. I want like a ref to come in and like blow a whistle. That's <laughs> a two minute warning too. Yeah. Like, what did you guys talk about while everyone was gone? Ooh. 
Oh, the world. <laughs> Little recap. The world. Sarah, <laughs> Sarah and I did speed talking in the other room. Yeah, it was really like the ethics surrounding AI and who's going to be responsible when things eventually, I mean, they've gone wrong. They've gone wrong. Like we already know that algorithms are racist. Like there are things that we know. And like the idea of just taking that into what Julio is saying, a computer controlling it built by people with biases is, is scary. What are you wearing on your hands? My hand warmers because my hands are cold. <laughs> I was going to say those are toast. great and I need them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But they're USB powered. Awesome. Uh, okay. I can get it really cold in the winter. Like I have that thing where like they don't get enough blood. So yeah. they're like super helpful. I'm the same problem. Very <laughs> cute. Get toast, Leo. Get these little toasts. <laughs> <laughs> Leo's gonna be on our next meeting. meeting. Is that from Adventure Time? Is that what that is? No, they're just cute toasts. Oh, toasts. Got it. Okay. <laughs> I sit here with a blanket on my lap all the time. Nancy has that too. <laughs> <laughs> I have one of those like electric uh, heaters that has like the simulated flame. Mm. I bought one of those. And after like three minutes, this room gets so toasty. I love it. Yeah. I'm in a, I'm in a t-shirt yeah. in, the, in the room. <laughs> Somehow we bought a heater from my husband's office and not mine. You have that <laughs> sweet looking fan though. I like... Every I don't know why every time I'm at the store I'm like I just I just have to. It's great. It's quiet. It's it's really it's also besides the fact that he got a fan and I didn't a heater. I'm the only room in the house without air conditioning. So mm -hmm. That's wow. wow. <laughs> One day just flip it on him, you know. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um. Well, it is just a little bit past eight thirty. I want to take. Uh, the time to say that this is the hard stop for the event. We don't have to necessarily just shut it all down. If you guys want to stick around and continue to talk, um, we can keep the uh, the stream going. But that does conclude tonight's event. I definitely want to say a big thanks uh, to all of you for participating in our winter community meeting. Um, want to thank our Speakers, again, Nancy and Randy, thank you guys so much for taking the time to prep this material and share it with our community. Um, it really means a lot. And um, again, we will be sending out a follow-up email after this that's going to have all three recordings. So if you didn't get a chance to hear all the material uh, from the Freelancer Forum or for the Design for Good, we will have <laughs> access to both of those. And we will be able to hear the, the great discussions that happened at the water cooler. Okay. Yeah, it looks like somebody regrets something now. <laughs> yeah. I, think I think I'm regretting uh, regret. mentioning neural filters. <laughs> I just didn't think about that at all. <laughs> uh -oh, now, now I want to watch it. Yeah, right. <laughs> Very informative. Um, and then uh, a part of that uh, follow-up email, we will be having um, a survey. So definitely take some time to give us some feedback. We still want to hear more from you guys um, about how we can continue to improve things here at AIJ Connecticut, uh, what we can uh, continue to evolve on and build on, uh, as well as um, things that we can uh, just continue to, to work better at. So um, again, thanks again. I hope you guys enjoy this uh, stormy night hopefully everyone is gonna stay warm and cozy um and yeah this is it this is wrapping up 2021 everybody so happy new year as well and um we'll see you at the next community meeting in the in the spring thank you everyone thank you thank you thank you guys bye good night everybody night night